As the world grows increasingly uncertain, many Americans are considering a previously unthinkable idea, preparing for the apocalypse. These preppers are ordinary people with extraordinary foresight, building bunkers, stockpiling supplies, and perfecting their survival plans in anticipation of the worst. But as the ghost of Armageddon looms larger and larger on the horizon, experts are beginning to ask the tough questions. Will these preppers be able to withstand the worst that the world can throw at them? Only time will tell if their inventions, resources, and toughness will be enough to rise from the ashes of the apocalypse. Join us as we look into the best prepared doomsday preppers of 2023. Bruce Beach nuclear attack. With more than half a century sitting behind him, retired scientist Bruce Beach has lived with the belief that an apocalyptic catastrophe will sweep the planet. Whether nuclear or otherwise, he believes that 80% of the population will perish within two years. His haven, which was built in 1985, is by no means the stereotypical underground bunker. However, it's an amazing 10,000 square foot shelter turned inside out, built from 42 recycled school buses. These buses connected and buried in concrete and earth provide strong resistance against the disasters of a nuclear winter. Bruce wishes to accommodate 500 refugees in this unorthodox ark, providing them with a safe place to live. He sees children as his main mission in life. He believes nourishing the young for life to continue is vital and that a better world must be rebuilt from the rubble. He is afraid an attack on U.S. missile bases would send radioactive plumes blowing hundreds of miles and may end up in his refuge in Ontario. Bruce and his wife Jean have maintained this apocalyptic shelter for over three decades. Yet, as they age, the younger generation comes forward to assist. Bruce's grandchildren, Evan and Shana, help with upkeep, sanitation, and even plumbing and electrical work, so that the Ark is still usable if that moment ever comes. Compulsory decontamination is the first vital step for arriving survivors. Stripping and showering are essential to remove harmful radioactive particles attached to the skin. To streamline this process, Bruce provides everyone with sterilized germicide suits and even stencils for name identification, because the radiation suits would make one unrecognized. It's all about survival in the beach household. Shana and her mother, Bahia, are painstakingly packing go-away kits, lifelines for people who can't enter the ark. These kits, equipped with radiation detectors, provide the opportunity for a life away from the steel citadel. Radiation is an invisible foe, and detectors like these dissimilars are navigation instruments amid the fallout. They help prevent hotspots from forming among those excluded from the ark and treat the sick among those already infected. On the other hand, Bruce reaches within and beyond family. He wants his community prepared. Today, he leads local school children into the ark's depths, hoping to increase awareness and encourage readiness. He sees a network of care, a community against the unimaginable. Inside the ark, a bunk room set aside for young refugees awaits. However, survival calls for more than just beds. He has tons of provisions stored in his pantry. Standing ready to feed the Ark's inhabitants is a spacious industrial kitchen geared to provide for thousands. But life underground involves special problems. The very breath of life itself becomes a priceless commodity, air. If the Ark's 10,000 square feet aren't adequately circulated, they would be a suffocating tomb in a matter of hours. Always the resourceful engineer, Bruce has devised an ingenious solution. Spanning the shelter's labyrinthine corridors is an intricate network of repurposed vacuum cleaner hoses that keep the Ark breathing. After all, it is a shelter forged from 42 recycled school buses, 10,000 square feet named Ark 2. There by his side is Jean, his wife and ever steady partner, her sacrifices a mute witness to their common dream. Their lives have been sacrificed without vacations, and their wardrobes are still packed in their boxes. But Bruce's vision is wider than his little ark. He has cast a net of Ark II preppers crosswise over the United States, 
planting the seeds of preparedness like wildfire. His latest, a lifeline to the outside world in the event of nuclear Armageddon, an off-grid communication system. In this endeavor, he teams up with fellow preppers and tech-savvy allies Greg Franklin and Lisa Maggiore. Their focus was ham radios, deceptively simple but powerful tools to pierce the electromagnetic silence caused by a nuclear explosion. Yet doubts gnaw at Bruce. Will his efforts be remembered? Will future generations continue to carry the burden of service to humanity that he has borne for so long? He realizes that he may be entirely wrong and will be written off and forgotten, but he's ready to accept that. The world's indifference hangs over him like a shroud he'll have worn all these years. Jeremy. Jeremy is a digital media entrepreneur. He faced a different kind of pressure than college funds and soccer practice. He foresaw a world choked by peak oil with the world's oil reserves running dry. The secret was on this suburbanite's doorstep, a prepper's haven getting ready for the end of civilization. The words that reverberated through Jeremy's head, peak oil, refer to the inevitable exhaustion of oil reserves. If the well runs dry, the wholesale price goes sky high and the wheels of society grind to a halt and its hunger the U.S. alone consumes 20 million barrels per day, set to rise by 2030, and the storm has already gathered. His nightmare scenario is that oil-producing nations slam the export valve, leaving American gas pumps gasping for air. One by one, the dominoes fall. Cars lie idle, workers stay home, and infrastructure falls apart. In this condition, the grid heavily dependent on fossil fuel was next to go down, and the nation would be thrust into darkness. 86% of Americans commute by car, as the once flowing source of life becomes only a sputtering trickle. Their solution, their hot tub. Kelly at first recoils at the thought of gulping down hot tub water. However, necessity is the mother of invention. They develop a filtration system, turning the frothy place of leisure into a 450 gallon lifeline. Rationing becomes their philosophy. Every drop is precious in the face of a thirsty tomorrow. The specter of medical emergencies in a grid-down world still haunts him. Antibiotics, life-saving defenders against infection would be scarce. Jeremy's unorthodox solution? Fish tank antibiotics. They are readily available, over-the-counter substitutes, providing a fallback in a world without doctors and pharmacies. But if violence comes to their community, antibiotics and hot chocolate are not enough, Jeremy has something of a plan B, a beast he will say no more about. Their escape pod was the M35, with its off-road performance and the ability to carry 5,000 pounds. Its huge compartment could accommodate a bunk bed, water tanks, food stores, everything for a bug out. But the beast needed fuel. Luckily, it wasn't picky. It was running on diesel, gasoline, and jet fuel. Most importantly, it could be fueled by used motor oil, the lifeblood of a dying civilization. For Jeremy, garages and service stations were gold mines. With 250 million cars in America, oil was a plentiful resource. His dream was to drain it, turning dirt into liquid gold. Each time a tank was drained, hope burned a little brighter. After three tanks, six were filled with 400 gallons of black gold each. For Jeremy and Kelly, the oil chase goes on. Since the beast is brought back to life by motor oil siphoned from vehicles on the highway, motor oil is still flowing. Three tanks, each containing 400 gallons of black gold, suddenly turn into their lifeline, holding out the promise of freedom for civilization in this world of peak oil. However, a mobile home requires a driver with these abilities. Kelly steps forward, eager to learn. Experts, impressed by Jeremy's initiative, give their opinions. They admit the beast is a formidable factor, fueled by many fuels, a huge advantage in a resource-scarce future. They offer advice, stock up on centrifuges for faster oil filtering, ready bug-out bags for immediate departure, and maintain the ever-ready beast. 
Jeremy listens closely, and he takes everything they say to heart. He and Kelly hustle to patch the holes. They fill bags with emergency provisions and stock the truck with consumables. Should the world go wild, the two hustle to be sure they can split quickly. As the debate over when peak oil will occur rages on, they opt not to wait. They know the Strategic Petroleum Reserve offers only a 38-day cushion against the oil slide. Bradford Frank, a veteran San Diego, California-based psychiatrist, Bradford Frank, holds the ominous belief that a fierce killer flu epidemic is about to overrun America. Though he has shown his cleverness in this professional capacity, his wife and daughter have some reservations about his apocalyptic visions. Their situation is made all the more desperate by financial difficulties, and Bradford, who has long been dubbed Dr. Doom by colleagues and friends just teeters on the edge. In Bradford's apocalyptic forecast, this superbug would tear through the population with ferocity never before seen. Cities would become wastelands with bodies lying in the streets amid scenes of body bags piled at the entrance to every hospital. Although the conservative estimate of a global pandemic by the World Health Organization is 100 million infections, Bradford is unfaltering in his opinion that it's not a question of whether, but when such a catastrophe will occur. With a stockpile of antibiotics and medications he had acquired through his medical credentials, Bradford conscripted his wife, Naren, to take inventory. But materials needed for his prepping activities have already cost him some $15,000 to date, and a few medications have already passed their expiration dates, raising concerns in his family. Naren asks Bradford to consider the possibility that his preparations were not necessary. Bradford stockpiles N95 masks, fearing airborne transmission, insisting that they filter 95% of airborne particles, including the virus. Wanting to engage his family in prepping, he recruits Naren and his daughter, Alexandra, to practice using these masks. With 400 masks in the stockpile, Bradford's determination to protect his family from the dangers he anticipates is clear. Bradford's professional preparedness confronts the practical considerations and financial drain on his wife and daughter. Caught between the caution of prevention and the darkness of being cautious, the Frank Specter hovers over the audience, begging everyone to consider the price of extremes when faced with an uncertain fate. Looking for the best prepper food, Bradford considers rice the perfect model, inexpensive, high in protein, and able to keep a long shelf life. He goes through an elaborate preservation process with food-grade buckets, mylar bags, and a special nitrogen sealing process for his design. It is accompanied by the particular sound of nitrogen displacing oxygen, and it becomes the crux of protecting the rice from deterioration over 10 years. The discourse raises the question of why provisions have such a long shelf life. Taking a pragmatic attitude, Bradford explains that longevity is perhaps not the greatest consideration, but he stresses the need to prepare for catastrophic scenarios in which dangerously chaotic situations or starvation could threaten survival. Whispers of the pandemic divided cracks in a family deeper than fault lines. Practical and youthful, Alexandra considered preparing a smart shield. The father, immersed in bird flu fears, was written off as obsessive. Naren, a woman who had survived the horrors of Cambodia, had much resentment in her. She'd cheated death harder in prison camps than almost anywhere else, and prepping seemed like a weak, feeble imitation of the real thing. Kind of pointless. Not easily deterred, Bradford turned their home into a fortress. Ballistic glass glistened a refuge against an unknown enemy. His dread was palpable. He had warned that supermarkets would be turned into graveyards. Yet Naren remained unmoved. Her world was one of grit and survival, not sanitized bunkers. The conflict intensified, creating this hidden tension in the nest. Here, Bradford saw a sword in the balance while Naren saw shadows of a past too real. Would their family be able to bridge this gap, 
or would the fear of the unknown destroy their fragile peace? Thanks for watching. Do well to like and subscribe for more updates. And while you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos.